Well, in our conversations about Texas after the American Civil War, we've talked about Indians and we've talked about the buffalo slaughter. Now it's time to talk about cattle drives. We've hit on it slightly in the past, kind of as an idea that cattle drives might have been an economic engine that helped Texas recover. Well, in fact, cattle drives are not new. I mean, it's not like somebody woke up one morning and said, hey, I've got an idea. Let's drive cattle. People have been driving cattle for a long, long time. Uh, there's a Spanish tradition of driving cattle. There's a Scottish and an Irish tradition of uh, driving cattle. And there's also an American tradition of driving cattle. You know, the Cumberland Gap, for instance, became known as a um, livestock transit point for Pete's sake. Tens of thousands of animals went through that uh, location. Uh, there's even hints of southern cattle drives across the American landscape. You may be familiar with the Battle of Cowpen, South Carolina, which was fought in 1781. But what a peculiar name. Why would they call it the Cowpens? Well, actually, that's a vestige of an old trail driving feature. Now, essentially, that's where they pinned the cattle and rested them as they were driving them to market in the Piedmont country of the Carolinas. So, as you can see, driving cattle is American, and it's Spanish, and it's Scottish, and it's Irish. It's a way of making money. In the uh, early part of the 19th century, Texans, Tejanos, Texians all drove cattle, mostly to Louisiana. But in the 1850s, they did follow the Shawnee Trail that headed up through Central Texas out through the northeastern part of Texas, actually uh, across to a place called Preston's Crossing, north of present-day Dallas, uh, and trailed those cattle up along the border between Arkansas and the Indian Territory into Sedalia, Missouri. A lot of times it's known as the Sedalia Trail as well. Um, from there, the cattle were spread into the Midwest. Sometimes Texas drovers would take them all the way to places like Chicago. Well, there's a couple of things that impede this trail driving in the 1850s, most notably tick fever, also known as Texas fever, and quarantines and sod busters that didn't like them. Yeah, lots of different impediments. But it's the American Civil War that really kind of crimps this habit of driving cattle. Except that Texas beef cattle are driven to feed Confederate armies until 1863, and then increasingly to Union armies out in New Mexico and Old Mexico after that. Um, but to give you an idea of the scope of cattle driving during the American Civil War, 1,000, 1,500 head herds are swum across the Mississippi. Yeah, swimming cattle across the Mississippi to feed Confederate armies. It's an amazing story. Well, when the war ends, the old habits pick up where they left off. And in fact, in 1866, there's about 200,000 head of livestock that are driven up the old Sedalia Trail, the Shawnee Trail, into Missouri. At the same time, there's another route pioneered, the famous Goodnight Loving Trail, which goes from the northwest Texas frontier down across the Pecos at the Horsehead Crossing and then over into eastern New Mexico with markets for U.S. forts there and also all the way up into Colorado. Well, there's some problems with this Shawnee Trail, Sedalia Trail, and the Goodnight Loving Trail. Um, for instance, the Shawnee Trail, increasingly you're having to ask permission to transit your cattle across farms. Farmers and cowmen do not get on. It reminds me of a musical. Uh, but there's also issues with the Good night, loving trail. It's dangerous. You're heading out there in the Indian Territory, and it's also dry, and um, you know it's pretty rough country out there. Now, the problem is there's money to be made <laughs> driving cattle. My gosh! At first, there's so many wild cattle, free cattle, mavericks they're called, that if you could just get them collected and tamed down enough to where you could actually manage them, you might be able to sell these free cattle for up to $60 a head if you could just get them to market. Well, 
Problem is, these wild cattle are also pretty buggy. They have all sorts of infections and diseases that are easily communicated to domestic cattle. And as a result, there's a lot of people that are not happy to see you coming when you bring your herd to town. Well, too bad, <laughs> because in 1867, an enterprising northerner by the name of Joseph G. McCoy actually follows the expanding railroad as it's going out across the plains of Kansas and gets to a town called Abilene. And there he builds a couple of cattle pens. Says, you know what, I am now gonna go down to Texas and tell those guys that if they can drive their cattle across this unoccupied region of the Central Plains to my cattle pens, we'll give them top dollar. And that very year, 35,000 head of cattle make it to McCoy's cattle pens. Well, these cowmen that are the pioneers of the trail drives are following an old road, an old cattle path that had been pioneered by a guy named Jesse Chisholm through the Indian Territory. Guess what? Pretty soon, that becomes known as the Chisholm Trail. And from that year forward, the number of animals going up the Chisholm Trail doubles nearly every year until it finally peaks at about 600,000 animals driven up that route in 1871. The beauty of the Chisholm Trail was that it was just west of the settlements, but just east of the Indian threats that we've just talked about. And it could follow the rails as they stretched across Kansas, almost like the spokes in a wheel, with the hub being right about San Antonio. So pretty soon, Abilene, Kansas fades, and then you head west to Ellsworth and beyond by the 1880s. 